Hello all and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 255th New Social Environment. I'm Anya Bernstein, a production assistant at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for Art on the Blockchain, Debates on NFTs and Crypto Art, a conversation with Rye David Bradley, and Brace Skirtle, Claudia Hart, and Stephen Sachs, moderated by Charlotte Kent. We're also thrilled to have the poet Sam Riviere here, who will close to read, uh, excuse me, will read to close today's program. To begin, I ask you to join us in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and the Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. We recognize white settler colonialism as part of the continual legacies of white supremacy, which has many contemporary expressions. We honor the memory of those that have lost their lives and to those that are working to undo this legacy of violence and injustice. And we acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Please check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And before I introduce today's guests, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's uh, guests and our host. Rye David Bradley is a digital native painter who has shown work both at galleries and museums around the world. For over a decade, his work centers has centered around 21st century painting in the digital sublime. His work is in the permanent collection of the National Gallery of Victoria, Herning Museum of Contemporary Art, Denmark, Lion House Museum, Melbourne, the Museum of Contemporary Art, Krakow, and numerous international private collections. And Brace Girdle is an art and blockchain thought leader, he currently head of sales US for Convelio and co-founder of the Art and Antiquities Blockchain Consortium. She previously led digital strategy at Superblue. And while at Christie's New York, she spearheaded the Art and Tech Initiative, which included the 2018 conference, Exploring B Blockchain, Is the Art World Ready for Consensus? During her 10 years at Christie's, she was a specialist of Russian art, 19th, 19th century European art and photographs, and speaks widely on the topic of art and blockchain and has been cited in the New York Times, the Financial Times, Forbes, the art newspaper, among others. Claudia Hart emerged as part of 90s intermedia artists in the identity art niche. Her work is about issues of the body, perception, nature collapsing into technology, and is in love with the interface between real and unreal because it offers a space of contemplation and transformation. Hart calls her work post photography and has created a body of theoretic writings and exhibitions based on this concept. An associate professor at School of the Art Institute, she developed a pedagogic program called Experimental 3D, the first art school curriculum teaching simulations technologies. She lives in New York and Chicago, is represented by Bitforms Gallery and is married to Austrian media artist, Kurt Henschlager. And Steven Sachs is founder and director of Bitforms Gallery, a leader in digital internet and new media art. Since 2001, the new, Bit new York Bitforms Gallery has been advocating and supporting media art, showing artists who push into the boundaries of this territory. Steven is an expert in the new media landscape and its evolving nature, as well as an authority on collecting and exhibiting digital art. And our host, Charlotte Kent, PhD, is an assistant professor of visual culture and an arts writer. So without further ado, Charlotte, please take it away. Thank you, Anya, um, and everyone for joining us. There is a lot to discuss surrounding blockchain. Um, and many of you here today may be fairly familiar with it. Some of you are not. So you'll forgive me, but I'm gonna start with a rather simple overview of the major voc vocabulary before we launch into the more interesting conversation with our panelists about why artists, galleries, and institutions would want to adopt this technology. So a non-fungible token, basic, aka nifties, specify the kind of token on the blockchain. A token simply represents a piece of information, 
Your work ID is a token that confirms you're employed by company X. In the cryptoverse, it can be a representation of money, of voting rights, any asset. That it's fungible simply means that it can be exchanged for similar. So fiat is fungible because when I loan you 20 bucks, I don't need you to return that exact same bill. Mm, if I loan you my Calder mobile, I do. <laughs> That's a non-fungible token. Art is a nifty, but so is a car. So nifties are a generic term and don't represent art per se. Crypto art highlights the association with cryptocurrency and was popular as a term for digital trading card models like Rev Pepe's or CryptoPunks, which you can see in the background of Anne. Jason Bailey of ArtGnome identified 10 features of crypto art, specifically in the context of Rev Pepe's. So it may not work as a general term, though time and usage will tell. Briefly, the cryptography entails a public key. Imagine it like your bank account number. The private key is your PIN, birthday, social security number all rolled into one. You do not want to be sharing this. The private key and public key are mathematically related. And then finally, the address is a unique sequence that functions kind of like an email address, but can only be used once for the specific transaction. The address is kind of a representation of the public key. Now, people worry that it would be possible to reverse from the public key to the private key because of the, their relationship. The math gets so complicated that the more you dig into how it's safe, the more you realize how complicated it is and that it is in fact incredibly difficult to reverse. So that even the most powerful computers would take many human lifetimes to compute this. Wallets are where your digital keys are stored and thus any tokens associated with your account. Your e-wallet is produced by a provider like Coinbase, or confusingly, there's one called Blockchain Wallet. <laughs> Ledger is a company that offers hardware this, like with a, about the size of a USB drive to plug into your phone or computer. So different wallets have different strengths, and that's why they are, there's so many different kinds. Now, on this slide, you're seeing an image of the blockchain process, and the rail folks are going to share the link to this image so you can look at it more closely later. I'm not going to explain all the steps. Basically, everything from the red box validation to verification is the mining process, which comes up a lot in terms of the environmental impact. It arises in terms of proof of work versus proof of stake, and we'll definitely be talking about all that later. When a token changes hands, an event is fired that identifies which account sent it, which account received it, and which token was transferred. This is all timestamped and stored in a block on the chain. Now, blockchain has certain features that make it particularly uh, distinct. So it is inherently distributed. Basically, blockchain is a data storage system using a distributed ledger. But it can be both decentralized, where all the participants have equal rights within the protocol, or centralized, where certain users get particular rights which may come up for certain art world applications. It is notoriously pseudonymous, but doesn't need to be. Um, as we all know, many of the buyers and sellers are, have clear identities, but that's not necessarily the case. It's resilient. On popular blockchain networks, the blockchain is replicated across thousands of computers. So as long as one still has the info, the chain can be brought back. Um, this is one of the reasons that it's considered particularly safe because if there's an electricity outage or there's government internet restrictions, as long as one computer is still there with the information, it will always all be there. It's hard to repudiate transactions since there is a confirmed auditable trail of activity. And this also makes it very hard to tamper with as any attempt to change is necessarily public. In all these ways, it operates transparent. And I'm gonna skip over the incentive structure for now, though it's one of the distinguishing features of proof of work versus proof of stake. So let me just say over the last week, there have been a flurry of articles about nifties and most have critiqued it. We're gonna to have to discuss those issues as it concerns arts being completely financialized or blockchain's environmental impact. But there's also a lot of misinformation and strange comparisons being made. There are reasons for artists, galleries, institutions to take on this technology. And in the midst of the unlikeliness of it disappearing, we need to address its potential 
and our hopes with it so we can better understand where we need to focus our attention to improve it as well as our practices. The last thing I want to mention before we get started is visual works are not on the blockchain. JPEGs and video files are far too large for that. When we talk about art being on the blockchain, we mean someone gets a token of metadata and the art is located elsewhere. Ownership can be distributed as Eve Sussman did with her 89 seconds atomized, but the image typically isn't since it exists in some location, whether as a file or on a wall. There are exceptions in some very interesting conceptual art projects that were part of early blockchain art. And this they operated sort of like net art. Simone de la Riviere's This Artwork is Always on Sale, Matt Ostachowski's Cloud Works, Primavera de Filippi's Plantoid, Martin Nadal's Bitcoin Traces, among others, represent conceptually sophisticated engagements with the technology that were largely ignored in favor of attention to the digital playing cards. Now, our artists today, Claudia and Rai, represent a more recent turn that embraces NIFTIs as just another part of a digitally inflected art practice. So with that in place, I'd actually like to start by having everyone on the panel today briefly share how and when they turned to NIFTIs. Um, Rai, I understand you've been tracking this since its earliest years. Uh, I believe you said 2010. So that's about as early as you can get. Um, perhaps you might start by telling us a little bit about what got you into it. As you said earlier um, about the transference of the file and maybe that the NFT is more the transference of the ownership of something, but the actual file itself is not tied to that on the blockchain. It's, it's really kind of a key point because it actually uh, indicates that uh, we are still transferring files from one place to another. And there's been a marketplace for selling files as artwork for quite a long time now. And in, and in 2010, there was a website called Tradebit and it was typically to buy and sell a software that you might write. And so people could download little apps or programs that you'd written. And so in 2010, I decided uh, as a little bit of a joke to like put Photoshop painting files there and that people could buy the actual original file and then even print it out if that's what they wanted to do. Um, and then for the next series of years after many exhibitions in galleries and museums and otherwise, I've always tried to find different ways of perhaps including the file in the sale of the work, sometimes by embedding a USB stick in the, in the painting frame or, or so on. And now I have this show with the whole gallery in the Bowery right now where the, where the NFTs are on super rare and the paintings are in the gallery in the Bowery. And it's just now that we have a more sophisticated way of making that transfer and also writing the ownership in a way that didn't exist before, mm -hmm. uh, which to me feels like really positive. So I've been talking to super rare for a couple of years, um, but I didn't really uh, make it take advantage of what was happening until probably earlier this year when I felt the space had achieved some sort of maturity that it had been looking for, um, because prior to that, it was a little bit unknown. Um, and when the time was right, um, we decided we would make this project happen. And it's uh, that's where we are now. That's great. Um, yeah, just for everyone, uh, there is a show right now. Um, the works are both these sort of tapestry canvases, but also um, available as works being sold through the blockchain. Um, and it got mentioned in your bio, you did a uh, basically a symposium on blockchain back in 2018. Um, what led you to organize that? Uh, well, I was a part of a symposium. Oh, sorry, it wasn't me. <laughs> sorry. I'm like, I missed you when we were organizing it. Um, um, my my uh, love affair with blockchain started um, as a result of my experience as a specialist at Christie's, where I, you know, became intimately familiar with how hard it is to be a client in the art world, how hard it is to buy, how hard it is to sell, um, how hard it is to get any information about any particular piece's provenance, et cetera. Um, and so when I first learned about blockchain, the use cases that crystallized for me were registrarial. Um, and then I quickly found CryptoPunks. At that point, CryptoPunks was sort of one of the only, uh, along with CryptoKitties, one of the only art, digital art NFTs that were available to sort of explore. And that 
the CryptoPunks is really like the first time that I where I really realized the potential of this of this industry, and I kind of immediately, genuinely thought of, you know, this in this movement being kind of our generation's pop art, and that might sound um, a little far fetched, but I was thinking about Warhol being fascinated with abundance, with the rise of consumer culture, with the rise of mass production, and how he was critiquing that and exploring that, and just really focusing on the way that we consume, and then to see these digital punks, um, I, I instantly thought of it just like critiquing the way and just exploring the way that we consume now, which is purely digitally, right? Um, so that, um, and I just fell in love with them as a concept, right? There's the value being created by the different, um, you know, different characteristics within them. So uh, that's sort of where my NFT um, progress started. And sorry, to answer your question, um, realizing that at that point, there were really like when I when I Google search art and blockchain at that point, there were maybe a handful of articles, mostly written by Jason Bailey of Artno, um, and no one in the industry was talking about it. Um, and I realized that we needed to have industry leaders like helping everyone understand how emerging technology, particularly blockchain, is going to revolutionize um, what we do. So, and thankfully, Christie's let us um, put it on. Yeah, I mean, Christie's has been has been very involved in this kind of thing as we just recently saw, right? Um, and with the AI too. But I wonder since you're just speaking about industry leaders, Steve, whether you would speak to it. I mean, Bitforms has been representing um, net-based digital computer art, all of it for 20 years now. Um, what made you finally decide to take it on? Um, well, yeah, I mean, we've been selling file-based works, as you said, for 20 years and you know, it kind of was, um, we were a little bit of, um, you know, not your traditional uh, gallery. So it was very challenging at first to convince people and explain people that a file is actually a work of art or can be a work of art. And over the years, I mean, we really used fairly traditional techniques for the, uh, you know, certification of, of the digital file. And it worked, but the audience was always small. It was never like a large audience in the art world. We reached a very specific audience that really um, embraced and engaged this type of work. But it was always an issue of how do we uh, come up with a better way, a more confident way to present uh, digitally based work. And over the years, uh, we kept on researching. There really wasn't a platform out there that worked. Um, what was interesting a few years back, we, um, I was at seven on seven at the new museum and Kevin McCoy um, actually revealed a project at the new museum called Monograph. And that was kind of the first experience I saw of someone taking a digital asset and assigning it to the blockchain as uh, you know, a, a unique token. So that was kind of a, an eye-opening ex experience for me. And and basically ever since then, we've been thinking about it, but nothing really uh, took hold until, of course, um, what's been happening recently where there is now a very large um, acceptance rate mm -hmm. for understanding the file as a work, a potential work of art. And for me, having a much broader audience uh, with an acceptance rate like that really is going to change the uh, perception and potential integrity of a lot of artists who have been working um, in digitally native files. With, um, on that note, I mean, obviously the last year has turned many people to a greater awareness of, you know, digital platforms, digital objects. Uh, there was an increase of interest in art on the blockchain that started around a year ago uh, with the pandemic shutting down so much. Um, Claudia, I believe it's been in the last year that you sort of turned to this, but also among, among other technologies like social VR and so forth. So what got you interested in blockchain in particular? You're muted. <laughs> Hi. So um, my thing is simulations technologies. So I've been working with them since they were available on PC computer, which is 25 years. And my weirdness is that I was trained to be an art historian. So I'm very interested in tracking how um, technologies of representation change and inform ideas about truth, ontology, 
what is authentic. And I, so for me, my trajectory goes uh, perspective, photography, and then post photography, simulations, technologies. And so the potential I got, uh, although I knew about, because within the digital art culture, this has been discussed for a while. What got me fired up was the potent, was this discussion about authenticity and the idea of the unique copy and how this has, and I think that is what's really hit when we see all of the excitement um, and the acceptance as everybody's been mentioning recently, it's almost like a kind of hysteria where the public at once acknowledges that there is truth to, there can be something true uh, with, it, with the blockchain, with the digital file. And so this is like a seismic shift in uh, um, ideas about ontology within culture and representation and images. And so that got me really excited. And I started working on a, a body of real, simulated but then real again um <laughs> things yeah so i mean let's actually take that and and rye maybe you can also join us here and um i want to ask you know the two of you as artists what are the advantages for you right i mean there's the conceptual side of it which thank you probably for sort of articulating your position rye sort of how you came to it but what are actually just some straight up um, advantages. Why is it worth taking the time to do this? Why did you decide to integrate this into other works that you're making? Well, I, I would say it, it like gave birth to a form for me because I was thinking about, yes, Warhol, was it Anne who brought up Warhol mm -hmm. or you, <laughs> and Rauschenberg and how these uh, ideas about, um, so I was particularly enamored of the Rauschenberg idea, the combine where you have the image of the thing, the representation of the thing and the real thing and how this makes a kind of liminal mixed reality object. And that is what I've, that's what I do for the past. I'm a mixed reality artist. And so it was like, woohoo. <laughs> and I, I made up a kind of form there. There, you see, I'm going behind it is a kind of hybrid uh, painting uh, piece of wood image that takes its form and it has a very uncanny feeling, these paintings that I'm making because I'm mixing levels of the real um, and pushing them back and forth in terms of ideas about JPEGs, mm -hmm. right? This is like a TIFF inspired processes that I made up. So, um, the idea that the JPEG is itself a kind of uh, the essential symbol of the, of the token, right? It's like, oh my, because the JPEG is the most common and simple form of a, a digital image. And so I think part of the scandal and excitement is, oh my God, a JPEG could be that valuable. <laughs> Well, yeah. and, and speaking of, I mean, the sort of ontological issues, right, but even when we were chatting, you mentioned to me that for you, it is the original, that the image starts as a digital file before it becomes anything else. Did I, but correct me if I got that wrong. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that that is the advantage to me, one of them. Um, when you make something that's screen-based, you fall in love with it. Uh, at that stage, and it, and it it almost feels like that's how it should be, and so when you take it out from the file based into some sort of material form, and that's an interesting translation, and sometimes that can be really successful and really beautiful, but a lot of the time it does feel like um, a translation. Mm -hmm. So the advantage to keep something natively as it is is amazing. As far as um, the advantage for history's sake goes, and which is the original. Um, I, I think originality is actually an emergent principle that can only be told through time. So in 300 years, we will know if the file or, or, the, or the physical counterpart becomes the, you, you kind of, you become the original. It's just when you go to a museum and you see all the ancient artifacts from two, 5,000, 10,000 years ago, they're not the only stone bowl from Egypt that there ever was, but now it's the only one we have. 
And so it becomes more original than it was. Mm -hmm. And if the digital is able to transcend time uh, well enough, which I hope it does, then it might even gain more of the original status than it has right now. I guess we're wrestling with that at the moment. That's that's what this is. Yeah, I mean, I, oh, please, Anna, go ahead. Can jump in and, and just some additional benefits to artists that have come up um, that I wanted to share. Um, from the from the business side of things, um, you know, it's aside from the block from blockchain being a medium, um, its benefit to artists can also be in relation to um, creating a digital ID or a token um, for each particular piece of work. So what that would do is it would create a, create a digital identity for anything that's additioned, right? So right now we know that contemporary art is valued by creating additions, um, which really, if you, if you dig into that, there's really no way to prove that an artist won't make another version of the edition or won't expand it, won't you know, gift them. Um, and you just have to trust the artist, you just have to trust the dealer and that's fine. But this technology provides an opportunity to create a digital ID that proves what the editions are. Um, and another thing that, that the technology can do is um, embed into the sale of a piece constant resale payment back to the artist every time it's sold on the secondary market. So just wanted to add those into the conversation as um, additional benefits for, for creators. Yeah, that happened to me. What happened to you? Uh, so, so when I sold the first NFT at that New York gallery show two, three weeks ago, the first person who bought it um, immediately relisted, triggered a 24 hour auction on it within minutes of me listing it. And then it resold six minutes later again. And then the royalties got paid immediately at the same time as well. And this all happened within five or six minutes, the whole process. And so it's a very fast moving space. It's very rapid. And I'm starting to realize that a lot of the people behind it are very fluent with financial trading. And so they, they have to be very fast. And, you, and this is just the mechanics of it. But with that royalty being paid like that, as Anne pointed out, um, it made it feel not as uh, as brutal as maybe works being flipped in traditional auction houses because a, a lot of artist friends I have that have had to experience that feel very left out from the entire thing. Um, so yeah, that's an that is an advantage for sure. I mean, I think it's worth. I was going to say, I think it's worth mentioning here. I mean, this has been, and for artists, this has been an issue that has been being talked about um, for fifty years, right? I mean, I think Seth Siegelob's the artist rights contract that was published across numerous magazines, shown at art fairs. I mean, really, sort of started in a big way this dialogue that has consistently not been being addressed. Um, the Artist Rights Society is a fantastic nonprofit organization that fights for artist rights. There's no cost to participate in it. They do a lot of work continuing to work on other channels to try and protect artist rights to the resale value of their works, but nothing's happened. So one of the things that's interesting about this technology is the fact that in the fact that nothing within the art world currently has addressed this particular problem, the technology has arrived that does. And yeah. one of this, it, when we are troubled by the way in which technologies operate, we also have to look at how it is that they are producing a solution to something that we haven't been willing to solve otherwise. Um, yeah. And that's, I, I think, go ahead. I would just quickly point out though, um, that it's not universal across, across all marketplaces. So it, it is still, um, like super rare and open sea from platforms they have to have reciprocal agreements to on to honor that royalty whatever it might be and if they don't or they then it doesn't work so it still has similar problems as well that it's proprietary it's a, to platforms in some way which yeah. uh, we need some some sort of global resolution of that to really or or get, we don't get somewhere or, or we, we don't, don't <laughs> because part of what's changed is the idea that what has entered the art world is contracts. So I've been showing in galleries for 40 years. And this to me also, sig the smart contract, the thing that both you, Charlotte, and Anne brought up, the things written into the code is essentially a contract. Now, and those things, not essentially, it is. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's a gentleman's agreement just the way copyright was, right? As somebody mentioned, we, you know, in the end, and you mentioned like, you don't know what we're gonna do, um, but we agree to that. And 
maybe only Disney can enforce the contracts. But aside from that, this makes the kind of contract culture becomes part of the art culture where we can clearly say, as Steve and I talked about, oh, I want to put a no resale thing. One year of no resale to protect um, this kind of flipping, especially mm. becomes threatening if you're combining a file, which is more flippable than an art object. And I'm doing what you are doing, which is offering a mixed combine on both a digital platform and on a gallery platform, which means both there are these two worlds with their different economies at this moment, because this is a work in progress, right? Our talking about this and deciding to do this kind of stuff is what is going to happen as 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 uh, uh, distribution points. I don't even want to call them galleries, museums, art centers, archives, galleries who work with digital art. We're now negotiating how we can handle all this. Mm. And Claudia, don't you find that exciting that to think that you could actually have like a source of truth to prove that your additions, like, don't you find that appealing? Yes, that's why I'm here. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think if I can just, you know, to keep going with the conversation and just noticing some of the things that people are wondering about, which has to do with how do you restrict, right? In part, because this is all within this like complex technology, you know, are you writing code that says Claudia said on March 16th that only, you know, like how do, how do the restrictions work? How do these contracts work? I mean, on one hand, I wanna say it varies, right? Um, the contracts vary per platform, the contracts vary in lots of different ways. There's also still aspirations, right? There are also things that people are talking about that don't exist yet, but that are currently being designed. So, the other thing that I just wanted to intervene and say here is that one of the things that's interesting about participating in this moment in the way that you know all of you are in Ryan and Claudia on the art side and, and the artist side are is that the participation starts to define what it's going to look like, right? Because of the choices you make, because of the needs you have, because of the requests you're making, because of the types of contracts you're asking for, you are therefore producing the need and the demand that then the technology has to support. So I think that's one of the things to just bring in mind is this is very much an in progress uh, moment. Um, just from the other side of it, because it, it also, it can be incredibly helpful, not only for artists. And can you just speak a little bit um, to the registry side, to the research side? I mean, why it is that this is actually you know, been something that you've been helping organizations with. Yeah, and I think just to add to that question that you must have read in the chat about how, how, how do you control these things, who's entering them, et cetera, I think that something that's worth um, noting is that um, it's nice, I, I like to think of it as like blockchain being able to help to be a foundation for industries, right? So I like to sort of wrap my head around like an entire industry sort of thinking about a blockchain or multiple blo interoperable blockchains serving as the foundation of the transactions in their industry. And so when you think about, well, who on earth is going to control all of that, right? Um, something that's happening now is there are consortia being formed, usually like third party nonprofit consortia per industry that has a, that has a team of people who are representatives from all parts of the industry, right? Who are helping determine standards, you know, governing structures, et cetera, acknowledging specifically that question. Um, and another thing that companies are exploring is whether or not they should use public versus private blockchain. And that's something that Charlotte mentioned earlier, right? There's this, the technology has the opportunity to be, you know, open um, to basically, so anyone could say like, I'm, I've made this Da Vinci, I'm putting it on, you know, X blockchain. Um, and then it's up to sort of like, you know, buyer beware, you can read the provenance and make your own decision or a private blockchain where there can be more control over who's adding property into that particular space. Anyway, so just wanted to touch on that because I think it's kind of important. But um, I think that, yeah, something that is exciting about the NFT enthusiasm is that it's getting people to think about the technology. But I, 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 I hope that a big takeaway from this talk is that there's so many benefits to the business itself and the way that we function, not just as like as a medium and with for, for artists, et cetera, but if you think about the fact that there is no 
singular record of auction, gallery sales, trades. There's no singular consolidated space for provenance, for value. Um, and you know the databases that do exist, um, to be quite frank, you can you can have you know like pieces that don't sell aren't included on them. You can have them removed if you wish. Um, so there's really nowhere there's no single source of truth for value and for provenance. And so research that's done, you know, when a piece goes from a gallery to an auction house to a private collector to another gallery, um, the same exact research has to happen into the history of that piece every time. It's not. It's not confirmed, documented somewhere, right? Um, it's really hard to be work to work in these institutions and also to engage in them as a buyer. You see, you know, and private auction sales, or sorry, private sales from galleries, those figures aren't visible anywhere, right? So as a buyer, you it's really hard to have a sense of what value means, right? How, am I making a good investment? It's really difficult to engage in this industry, and so blockchain provides a foundational layer on which all of those details are tracked, right? And then the pieces, as they move back and forth within the same institutions and from, you know, from buyer to seller to gallery to museum, everyone's functioning on the same registrarial platform and we all have access to the same information. And I think I envision that just being a much more simplified universe where, you know, many, many pieces trade back and forth to the same places Many of us have overlapping clients, have overlapping data. So this shared notion of you know, sharing our data while maintaining privacy, like maintaining institutional privacy, client privacy, there's so much potential there. I'm sorry, I could just, now I'm just rambling. I could keep going. Um, those are sort of the immediate things. Um, there is more to say, but I'll let other people contribute. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, you know, it's worth maybe just sort of slipping here into the next part of the conversation, which we need to have. Um, we've been talking a lot by necessity of, you know, the finance side, the contract side, the tracking of value, um, the sales points and so forth. And so I feel like at this point, I'd let, I'd, I'm inviting all four of you to sort of just participate in the conversation that a lot of the articles that have been coming out are really concerned with blockchain basically representing the complete financialization of art um, that whatever utopian dreams the blockchain's potential might offer ignore or obscure the financial schemes that are actually undergirding this entire system um, those are real and concerning for people because they're hard to understand and there are questions around sort of the way in which finance, you know, hooks into art in this way. So I'm just wondering if any of you can speak to how the art world can mitigate the financialization implied by blockchain. Um, if there are ways around it, what you're thinking about in terms of it. Well, well can I just bring one thing up before we go to the high end again? Okay. Because I'm in the context of experiment. I mean, I'm a digital artist and that's what I've done my entire life. And we are considered in the trajectory of experimental film, even though we're part of the art discussion, conscious of it, we're not um, um, uh, 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 outside of it, we're inside of it, but we're called experimental because our work has been resistant to the market because it's ephemeral. So one of the things this does, aside from the airy fairy billions of dollars of currency traders, which is not the reality of what uh, most of what will happen will be for artists, right? Because we're not all Jeff Koons, although um, is that it opens up um, the entire spectrum of the art world to a lot of people who were not part of it. So I think aside from everybody wants to talk about the super high end because it's spectacular and horrifying and scary and, you know, like a TV show, but basically um, the real life thing is all of the rest, which is a big deal. I also think to your point, Claudia, um, blockchain as a, as a technology is actually pretty boring. <laughs> like it's, it's, you know, it's a registrarial tool that, you know, provides 
decentralized transparency and and supply chain management. And I think that again, like if we can if we can break okay, so to address the question about like okay, again, like the crazy figures for trading this work, right? So that financial aspect. When you, the immediate thing I thought of was the fact that so many artist prices are still controlled in the market right now. Like contemporary art, so much of that pricing is controlled. You have dealers going to auctions and buying artists that they represent to control the market. You have an entire market of a certain piece of like nuanced work, like dying overnight because that particular collector passed away. Like there, so I'm, I think more relevant to that is the dealers controlling their market by buying in a way that's more relevant. But I think that that is one conversation that you're mentioning, Charlotte, but I think I'd also like to ask you to specify, like when it comes to the tool providing more transparency and efficiency and like simplifying so much of our business, it's so complex, like which elements do you think tie to your question, if that makes sense? Maybe we can sort of tease those out of it. I mean, I think, let me start. Let me let me sort of start with where I was thinking of, and and some of some of the discourse that's been happening in the sort of flurry of articles of the last week, right? There's the concern of the fact that um, blockchain was designed as a as a currency, right? And the token is itself emblematic of that, right? So that art should be exclusively locked into this currency frame. Um, seems to be the sort of death knell of any prior alternative concepts of what art is or was or does or did, right? I think, um, I think I'm interrupting you, Charlotte, because yeah. you encouraged us to interrupt. Go I would it. challenge that. Blockchain yeah, is too. not, I don't think it, it's not a currency. Yeah. Bitcoin, like the blockchain technology that is the foundation of Bitcoin is completely different from currency. So, mm -hmm. and that's what, again, like a huge takeaway when you think about like what's holding back so many people from embracing it is that they immediately associate it with currency, but the technology was created to, to allow peer-to-peer -peer currency trading, mm -hmm. just like it allows digital assets to go back and forth. So I just wanted to make that clear and see and just ask if that affects your your thought. Well, I I think it, right, but, what but I want also like I kind of say like because it did emerge from the 1980s cypherpunk community and 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 they weren't they, they weren't talking about currency at all. They were talking about like tamper proof, mm -hmm. resistant proof way of protecting because they could see it sometime in the future that if everything was going to get more digital, there would be exactly the world we have now where everybody's isolated and nobody ha and everything's going into small towers of facebook and five other platforms and then that's it and everything and they, they wanted to avoid that and yeah it was originally founded as a filing system well so yeah. i was going to say i think what's at stake here is the way in which as i, I tried to sort of say it's a it's a it's a database storage system it's basically an information transfer system right and as as since our internet world is about moving information around right this is one of the ways that that can be tracked um, and yet still keep some sense of um, privacy or anonymity, depending on which way you want to go down that road. I think the reason, um, and I'm glad you identified that because I think that's a really important point, right? I think because of the way in which there is that finance side of it, those two things get locked in, right? There's been so much financial speculation within it. This, the entire realm of conversation around it is about this. What it points to is the fact that if we are truly living in the age of information, information has been financialized and everything is becoming bits of information that are being traded around. So, I mean, we can take it a step back, right? And talk about like, is, is art now this just data point, right? An, an information moment. And I, I, you know, that's sort of a more complicated version of the question I was asking around finance, but I think it's worth asking because I think many people still have a strong sensibility that art isn't or shouldn't or don't want art to be that. Wait, don't, art to, don't want art to be what specifically? To be just a point of information that's moving around, that there's a sense that art is more, does more for us, that it's... You know, that it isn't just a dollar value. It isn't just mm -hmm. this like point of data moving across a chain, like a little, you know, factory box. 
I feel like for me, this is like the evolution of contemporary art. This is the evolution of conceptual art, right? I mean, if we think of how many examples can we give of like three, literally 10 fish balloons selling for $500,000, like, I guess for me, I, I don't know, and please everyone jump in, but um, that's sort of my instinct on it. Well, it also has to do with ethics and like holdovers about the function of an artist. So as things have evolved, um, well, what started me on this whole route was um, I was invited to make a show in a game. It was a art, it's an art trading, art selling game. And I, well, this was very tantalizing to me. And, but after thinking about it for about five minutes or two, I realized, oh, yes, of course, everybody the, I'm not, act, everybody makes money in this thing, but me, it's like Facebook. I provide content, the art, the game owner makes money and the game players um, uh, um, also actually pay for the product. So I think this is a holdover from this sort of um, um, Western ideal of the artist as a kind of, we die for your sins kind of, person <laughs> we're holy and we're pure uh, we're, this is the humanistic ideal of the artist as as the hand you know the god speaks through our hand and so we're supposed to be pure not even think about survival or money or how we might live and what's evolved are systems in which you know no we don't get fees we get nothing most of the time. Yes, a few people at the top of the market do, but you can be shown a lot and have very active career. I do. And you still, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a professor and I work for my money. So this is like a cultural mythology. Talk about the deconstructing capital, you know, <laughs> like which one do you want to deconstruct? Which came first, you know? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think one of the things to sort of get at is the fact that artists have to do many things to sell their work, right? Um, they make t-shirts, <laughs> they do odd jobs, um, and the, there, there is, I think, an important aspect of this, that this is, a, this is an opportunity for artists to make money. Um, I think it's, one of, it's an interesting opportunity for artists to make money from their art. Um, as Rai was mentioning earlier, there are many artists who work with, um, you know, digital software to sketch out uh, their works. They're not necessarily like doing sketchbook drawings or doing studies in oil paint, right? They're doing, the, they're doing that early work in Photoshop. Um, right now, simply because of some of the ideas around it, there hasn't been a way to think that through. And you know, sure, okay, people can print it out, right? But it's, it's this very odd thing. And one of the things that blockchain seems to have suddenly allowed us to start thinking through is the possibility that it actually, that as a digital object, it has, um, it, ha it has a value that is integral to the entire art production. Um, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm saying that the, the issue is that right now, what most of the platforms are revealing are very small, constrained glimpses into the artist practice. You know, we've been doing this for a while, and my artists have, a, Claudia included, have a deep um, body of work that goes beyond the system that's currently, you know, generating this frenzy. Um, and the definition of digital art by a wider audience, uh, understanding that these JPEGs or very short animations is the definition of digital art is, is, is uh, I think a bit of a problem for again, the many, many incredible artists that have been working for 10, 20, 30, 40 years who actually care about presentation, who care about exhibit, who care about emotional connection. There's a real, uh, I, I missed some of the conversation because I was out, but um, you know, this, this, the financial aspect being at the forefront, which is no doubt, I mean, if they're calling it crypto art, you know, money is pushing the, the practice. And I feel there's a danger for, you know, career artists who really are going deep to, um, 
to either get left behind or change their work to accommodate the new financial platform. And, well, uh, yeah. right. I mean, I was going to say, I think this is one of the places where the notion of centralization comes back, right? So you know, the idea of it being a distributed ledger, you know, attaches all these notions that, you know, it should just be this kind of open free for all. Um, I was at a symposium on blockchain back in 2019 and the group of, you know, people who were there were already talking about the fact that we do, we kind of need to get together as a group of you know, the sort of auction houses for blockchain art and discuss how can we collaborate so as to make sure that artists aren't double posting their work so that there is some kind of like internal consensus for those of us who are dealing with this on best practices and on how we're going to do certain types of verification. It's, I mean, the, again, I think one of the things that sort of comes forward is the fact that this is a technology, it has its uses, the industry is going to have to figure out how to make those relevant, useful, and, and, and pertinent for the art industry as the art industry wants itself to be and to develop into. Um, mm -hmm. From that note, just I want us to shift into the other concern that people have, which is the environmental. Right, there are countless articles out there about um, the energy consumption being used by blockchain. And I know many of us have things to say about that, but I'd invite you to sort of speak to this flurry of um, press on that topic. Charlotte, are you gonna explain the difference now for us? between POS and POW or more. I, mean, I think when it, when it comes up, I will. I mean, if the, if you want to speak to why it is that you're hoping for proof of stake. Um, I'm not just hoping, I am hope that I'm crusading and the, 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 gal, the artists that are my friends are, and Steve can testify to how much we talk to him about this and the other platforms that I'm working with that are all within the digital art culture and how we're insisting that we won't use the more ecologically extremely damaging system, which is called proof of work. And there are these uh, other uh, systems, the proof of stake on the right side there. And part of the reason why all the stuff has resided with proof of work, including the top ends of the market that are, that all the excitement was about, right? And thank you anyway, Anne, because the excitement is what allows the rest of us to like ride in on your tidal wave, <laughs> um, is, is um, that the um, uh, ETH, right? Is the more common and the very pollutant one is where all the currency trading is going on and currency traders have excess of it and they speculate within the currency trade speculation uh, culture on, on works that are within the same blockchain, right? And there's these other more eco blockchains, um, which are uh, proof of stake, which have less money in them. But I think what you just brought up, Charlotte, is that if one makes networks of um, people seriously involved in in digital practice and which includes everybody, Charlotte, as you mentioned, right? Including painters. And I, I, my, I teach everybody in all, I teach cross-platform at a School of the Art Institute. I have as many painters as I have um, VR people. Um, is that you create networks of community, which includes collectors and artists who are not working at that you know, where they're working in another blockchain, right? <laughs> there isn't one blockchain, there are multiple blockchains. Some are very uh, ecologically, you know, horrific and some are not. Right, and I think I'll just add to that, Claudia, that what you mentioned Ethereum, um, they have, you know, uh, consensus has made it clear that they're trying, that they're working on building another consensus mechanism. But I think we can back up a bit for the, for the audience and maybe, um, you know, Charlotte, if you want to talk about what this actually, so that what this issue is, is like to, to move along, um, to, to move a piece 
or whatever we're talking about, uh, whether it be a digital asset in this case, um, to move it through as it moves through different transactions, um, each time something happens to that piece, whether it's traded or someone buys it, for instance, another block is added to that that one item's chain. And to do that, um, the consensus has to be reached within the network that all of that information is accurate. And so that's what we're talking about. And there's, and it's the the anyway, Charlotte, if you want to give an overview of of the different proofs, because I think that the answer to this question is that these new these new consensus mechanisms are being explored, proof of stake, proof of reputation. I read about a proof of harvest. Um, so I think that they're being, they're evolving. Um, anyway, Charlotte, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I mean, it's, I think this gets really complicated because on some level to, to explain how proof of work works um, requires going into the nitty gritty of how blockchain operates. Um, there's a number of really good articles out there about it. The thing that's difficult about it is that once that someone has solved the problem, the sort of math, the, the puzzle as it will, that makes something be secure, everyone has to then, that's the consensus I was talking about, everyone then has to agree that that's the right solution to that puzzle. Um, that's where all of this energy intensity comes from. The calculating energy usage is incredibly complicated. Um, this is not to deny the fact that uh, proof of work as a system is incredibly intensive, but part of the challenge in calculating it is like, there are you know, miners all over the world, their proximity to electric, to, to electric outages, that's their, their locations, whether they're in a big group or whether they're operating independently, all of these things get sort of merged, like muddled together because we often wind up comparing, you know, how much a miner is using in terms of energy to someone who just lives at home, right? Which is kind of not the same because basically that's a business that they're operating, right? So it starts to, the whole conversation around this gets really complicated. Um, the thing around proof of stake is that it would be a significantly less energy intensive by, by many orders, a less energy intensive practice. The reason people have been concerned about whether it's actually going to occur, right? And I know many of you do believe that it is going to happen and that there will be a big switch over to it, is that in the last couple of years, even companies, um, platforms like Foundation that tried to come forward with it. And so Foundation launched as proof of stake and basically all the users on the platform was sort of, it, it made things too difficult for them for it to be different. And so they backtracked and went to proof of work, right? And this has been this recurring thing because one of the things that happens with technology is when people get used to it being a certain way, they don't wanna to have to change. They don't wanna to have to change the way they operate. Um, this is why we don't like certain types of updates to our softwares and so forth, right? It's a, it's a similar kind of thing. Um, the question here is with this new interest in blockchain for the art industry, is this an opportunity to really get behind a system that is operating on proof of stake? And there's, an, and there's a number of different options. There's Pixios, there's Kadado, there's Calamant. I mean, there's information out there about these different ones. And one of the big things that's probably gonna have to happen is that whether it's a group of galleries or whether it's a, you know, a group of industry leaders who get together and decide we are going to work with this one, right? But for that to happen and for that to happen in a way that makes it be um, environmentally safer as it will for um, the industry, people have to agree on what the values are. Like we want it to be not so energy intensive. We want it to be X, Y, Z. This is the yeah. one we're gonna get behind to make that happen. True, um, can I say, Please. Um, that regardless of what we do about that, even if we do switch to proof of stake, it still doesn't take away from the fact that we need cloud computing, hard drive storage, gigantic facilities. I, I'm pretty sure that YouTube probably uses a lot more data storage right now. It has a massive carbon footprint if you compare it to the blockchain. And nobody's calling for YouTube to be taken down and like stop streaming videos and like don't do live stream on YouTube because you're killing the planet. But, but, but that is true and that, that won't go away. Regardless if we get proof, proof of stake or not, we still have this problem of how we generate power in the first place. Ultimately, I hope we can find solutions, be it nuclear fusion, be it 
more dense hydro or solar. We, that's the real problem. Even if we do proof of stake, we, we're not going to fix the problem that trying to run those cloud computing data centers takes unbelievable amount and that won't change. So it's that's why I feel like this argument is a little bit of what's called FUD in the kind of crypto language, like fear, uncertainty, and doubt. You know, you push the price down, you, you kind of insert this uncertainty into it. Um, a lot of it comes from the right place, but, uh, but it, it also needs to be applied universally. And I, I disagree. Of work thing. I mean, I think we're starting now. In a way, this is a, a chant, not in a way. What's really happening now is it is happening, is a rethinking of how the art industry, period, can function, right? Mm -hmm. Not just uh the di us digital ones here, but here. How, right like how the market functions how the auction houses everything you've mentioned earlier charlotte including yeah, you yeah. know so we're starting we can reinvent things not from zero because we're not uh i mean i'm not 25 i'm 65 so i'm more realistic but um we certainly can say well maybe i can't change youtube but i can I Why can not? change my world. <laughs> no, but I actually yeah. think that that's an interesting point that I mean, that's what Rai is bringing up, right? Absolutely. I think in every way we want to be making positive choices. If the industry can help shift that as an industry overall, it will only work with proof of stake, that would be significant, right? That would really shift things. I mean, super rare, all of these different sites would really have to either give up the entire industry or they would have to shift over. So it's not to be denied that we want to advocate for these things, but I think the point that Rai is bringing up is how curious it is that, um, and this is one of the reasons I have that I included this slide. I mean, granted it's from 2017 and Bitcoin alone has tripled um, its energy consumption in the last uh, in, in the last four years since then. So it's no longer at 0.07%, it's more like at 0.2, but um, let us just take a moment to recognize that it is impossible for you to even have a color that you can see in this graph of the environment, the, the carbon cost of Bitcoin or Ethereum, because in fact, though, yes, it technically falls under the yellow of energy. It is so minute in comparison to some of these other areas that the larger question returns, why is it that this one particular industry is being attacked? Um, for its energy consumption when there are major areas that aren't. Um, one of the facts that often people like to bring up, and so I'm gonna be the one to bring it up here, is that the whole concept of a carbon offset calculator was initiated by BP oil, right? And why would they do that? Except to make us individuals responsible rather than their having to change any of their practices. So one of the questions comes back to the fact that yes, I, am, I stopped eating meat a few years ago because that was a small thing that I could do in terms of the carbon cost of the agriculture industry. That was a personal choice I made. However, perhaps we also have a responsibility separately from those individual small acts we can do to address the much larger industry, which isn't Bitcoin or Ethereum, but is all the other elements of the energy industry like fracking, like coal, like, you know, the, how can we move to solar, you know, all of these different areas. So um, I wasn't expecting to go off quite like that, but I'll send it back to you all too. <laughs> Charlotte, I, just, I was just thinking as you were saying that, that it's almost ironic that um, it seems that, you know, the creating transparent supply chains is definitely, you know, one of the best use cases for the technology. And there are many companies exploring how to create global standards for measuring carbon emissions and to track where they're generated across the supply chain. So actually, interestingly, blockchain is one of the most like fascinating solutions to actually measure this more, um, more efficiently. Um, mm. Just throwing that out there. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, right. I forgot the name, but there's some specific crypto projects that are just specifically about this. Yeah. Going to and make again, things more efficient. Yeah. yeah, and it's exciting, again, I, I just to follow what Claudia said about um, just improving the industry, I feel like, a, again, a big takeaway is to, to really make sure that, you know, everyone, when they're learning about this, I mean, again, my, all of us, all of us, um, to really make sure that we separate and categorize what we're talking about, right? Like, 
um, you know, at Rise, you just said like a, a, a crypto organization talking about this environmental concerns. Yes, but let's also bear in mind like. Let's think of it as a as a foundational layer. Let's think about it as tracking supply chain. Let's think about it as an artistic medium, right? Like if we can, if everyone can start to bucket the different categories into which this technology falls, it might help just move the conversation forward because my God, like how many topics have we discussed in the last hour? Um, and if you're tired, you can't be tired yet because I have a couple more questions for you before I, I get the audience to ask. <laughs> well, but I also think the role of an artist, while I don't want to die for anybody's sins, is also not to be an apologist for um, the worst aspects of our culture, but to sort of be able to foreground things that become public discussions. That's what artists are pretty good at doing. Um, and, you know, news people like to write about us and it brings conversations to the foreground. So I, I think we can, um, you know, let's do that. Right, I mean, that, that can be another call to action, right? It's like, to what degree can artists working with blockchain be a part of the conversation and have their works, you know, either be, a, you know, speak to it in some way or when they're talking about it, speak to it as I'm asking you all to do. Um, the reason I think it, it comes up so much in uh, the sort of public discourse around it is because it's an exciting new technology. It's sort of, many people don't understand it. And we like to throw statistics around, right? We like to sort of throw you know, numbers around and how many of us have the time to double check them, right? There is a kind of integrity expected of artists as Claudia was mentioning. So when artists speak to some of these issues, there is a kind of trust there in what they're saying. Um, Mostly, <laughs> I'll leave that one. Um, just before we hand it over to the audience, because I know there are so many questions, uh, so many questions that have been uh, sort of popping up. One of the things I wanted to ask you is, um, what are some of the possibilities? What are some of the hopes you see for this industry? We haven't got a chance to talk about all the different use cases. Um, there are many different ones. So uh, some of them are still in development. Um, so there's the area of like different uses of it for us in the art world. There's, you know, are there developmental practices? Like, what is it that you're hoping that either exists now but can be enhanced or doesn't exist yet that you would like to see um, arise in the sooner rather than later? I can try to answer that. Um, well, I had a recent experience that gave me hope and, and it was quite exciting. Um, one of my artists, Jonathan Monahan, um, he was um, on foundation and he had a piece and he had bids and one of the bidders lost and they actually wound up coming into the gallery and inquiring about more work, looking at a deeper understanding of what the artist can do. And my hope for all of this is it opens up for maybe digitally native artists or artists in general, um, a wider audience, audience for inquiry um, that goes beyond, again, this financial incentive. Um, you know, this, this flipping mentality, although exists in the traditional world, traditional art world, is much more extreme here. Uh, as Rai was saying, within seconds, someone put his piece up and the bidding started. And that just, you know, it, it makes it a little challenging to stay true to the um, inherent nature of the creative process when that is constantly in the back of your mind, who's gonna bid, is it gonna flip, et cetera. So my hope is basically that, that it provides um, a new window into a larger um, uh, artist practice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what we don't have right now is um, we don't have a, an adequate way to even experience NFTs or digital work itself. There's a few metaverses that are emerging, like Decentraland, and Crypto Voxels, and a bunch of others. They're they're reasonably interesting to kind of walk through at the moment, but you can they still feel very nascent in some ways. I can see uh, maybe in three or four or five years, and walking through a space like that might actually be really interesting and able to render it uh, immediately and um, become very compelling and be more about the experience of being inside of it. 
and the blockchain uh, just enables perhaps to charge a small admission fee or like some sort of permission to view something or permission to share something or permission to upload something. It might not always be about ownership and high price tags. It might move back to a more like vernacular layer that enables people to just walk through the metaverse and interact and for, for people who create content for it to also get the rights management system for that content so that we have the really healthy kind of mar marketplace this might not be till 2030 before it's really truly happening. So, you know, um, in, in the shorter term right now, um, I think we need to find ways to split contracts up into multiple, to reflect multiple uh, ownership of, 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 of a singular thing, perhaps so like a group could buy something together. Or also if uh, somebody wants to have part go to their gallery and part go to someone else and, and there's no way to do that right now. So I just, did a space in Decentraland with Koenig Gallery from Berlin, which we're launch launching on Sunday. And the problem now that we have is the gallery can't mint the NFTs because it wouldn't look right. Because if, if the work really sold, where did the royalties go and how does it we even deal with all of that? So right now there's just, there's just no way to really do it other than for the artists to mint it themselves and then um, just make a promise to the gallery that you know that you'll they'll, that will share it. And mm -hmm. there's no contract that we can really do about that, but we. We really need that for the traditional art world to come in for a lot of great artists to come in to kind of maybe balance this thing out a little bit and take it away from the speculative nature that it's suffering with but not suffering with or i don't know if it's suffering is it is it <laughs> sure well i, I, I could use some they were all jumping in i noticed uh, on the sidebar a lot related to what david's saying i mean rye excuse me um with the um contracts and the issue between the so uh there were a number between the 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 digital file and work that has both components right physical and digital and there are a lot of people saying on the sidebar here well what about us we don't make digital art um yeah. and how can we be part of this but i mean going to the uh, my thing is of course about representation and a more conceptualization of the image but there is the issue, there is the very important thing that's been discussed certainly with performance art and everything else about documentation of the art and how, you know, within a, a, a digital culture and mediated culture, we don't, the documentation becomes as important as the physical object. Maybe not true, but there is a profound relationship between the two. So thinking about your documentation your certificate of authenticity, which includes your documentation as an extension conceptually of what you do, um, is I think a sort of natural way, natural in a mediated nature, right? Um, to, to, to think for, for artists who I see people sitting in their painting studios and on, on uh, the channel here. So I, I don't see it precludes it at all. It's an expansion. No, I mean, eventually, like, even traditional objects will possibly be sold this way as well. There'll just be a second step where the actual work is transported to the, mm. to the collector. We just don't have that yet. So that's why we're seeing digital art only function in this space, because it's just so easy to do. There's no resistance yet. Um, but soon, I think traditional painters who make paintings in their studio might be able to use a platform that they can then transfer the ownership of that painting just to mm -hmm. a collector maybe via a platform and that it somehow be the trust layer operating with this nft architecture to make that possible um ultimately yeah the the physical works would um you know could be it's the sort of you know the digital the air gap that exists currently like once there's an industry-wide agreement of like what we're going to connect to or fingerprint how we're going to fingerprint print a physical piece of work then the digital identity that represents that physical work becomes the nft and um you know my yeah. my sort of like vision my like I, I, ideal vision for the future is one where you know the the art world um creates either, you know, like consortia or, you know, like how many, however many consortia we need to like create standard like governance for creating interoperable blockchains on which all, fi all fine art is traded and all of the information about provenance and values, the certificates of authenticity, that's all 
stored in these, in these blockchains, the value is transparent. Um, the collectors and the owners re remain, you know, anonymous. Um, and with that, you know, there's the rise of digital, ID digital IDs for people, right? And so if you think about a future where we'll all have our digital IDs that are registered on blockchains, for instance, we could connect those two, right? Like I see blockchain as being the solution for collection management, where you're pieces that you currently have no access to if they're at galleries or auction houses, right? You can't access them digitally. Um, if you could, and they could connect to your digital ID on a blockchain, um, then you'd have an automatic collection management system, which I find absolutely mind blowing personally. Um, so that's my, I'll leave on that note. That's sort of my futuristic vision. I mean, I would just add on that and I don't totally understand how it operates because I don't actually understand the insurance industry all that well, but there is already blockchain insurance in the sense that at different moments when art is traveling from one location to the next, there are um, higher risk points. And so if you uh, put, a, put a work that is going to be moving you know, from point X to point Y, um, on the blockchain at different points, the costs are different. And one of the things that they are finding is that the insurance costs actually decrease um, because of the fact that it, it can fluctuate in that sense more easily than the current practices. Um, in other words, that's an example of how art could be on the blockchain that's a physical object that has no, there's no, you know, JPEG, there's no video, there's no, there's no physical thing that some, or no digital object that needs to be a part of it, but the work is existing on some level on the blockchain in that sense. So for those who are sort of wondering how I'm, you know, for those who have no interest in producing digital art, but are thinking about like, how would this potentially influence them? That's a very, very simple way that it could. Yeah. Um, and again, it does require this sort of a surprisingly difficult thing for the art world, which is to collaborate and to create yeah. a consortium. Um, this is something that despite there being so many artists who make work precisely about this topic, the industry itself is often wary of joining together and collaborating in this way. Um, I think, you know, for the blockchain, that's gonna become really important. Um, and I, I will say from my perspective, I'm hopeful that it will, because I will quite honestly say my, the one fear I do have is that if um, major figures in the art world, collectors, um, patrons, funders, artists, galleries, museums, institutions of all kinds, don't on some level come together and start thinking through these issues and start developing some of the things that have been articulated here. Then we do leave it at the hands of people who are technology developers who have no vested interest in the art world that has been very articulate in the last several decades in specifying what kind of world it wants to be, how it wants to operate, how it wants to be open for many different audiences to be able to participate in it in these different ways. So, if we don't do this thing now in this early moment, right, we run the risk of the fact that the people we often are say we don't trust, which is the technology developers, the financiers, and so forth, will do it for us, and we'll be stuck with whatever it is that they decide we're going to use. Um, we've seen that happen before, and I think it would be a shame to see that happen now. On that note, um, I want to let some of the many questions that have been popping up uh, get asked to you directly. So Anya, perhaps you could take it over for us. This has been the most active chat. <laughs> yeah, I love this chat. I've been really reading all of it. <laughs> I'm learning a lot. I feel like I love that there's a dialogue happening. Um, our first question in the Q&A comes from Lake O'Brien. And you should be able to turn on your microphone. <clears throat> hey, Anya, thanks. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, my question, I'm not sure if it's... I feel like it's kind of been addressed or maybe not. It's hard for me to even tell, honestly. Um, but I'm basically just wondering about, you know, the assignment value to the digital original and that it seems kind of like it's happening in a backwards way, right? Where it's sort of just happening. Um, 
yeah, I'm not sure how to phrase the question really. I just would, I would like to hear y'all um, <clears throat> talk about like, I'm happy value to, here, basically. I'm happy so, to, you know, value, yeah. like financial value. I'm happy to quickly just, my immediate reaction to that, Blake, which is such, an, such a fascinating question is, if you think about how value is created now for contemporary artists, for the most part, it's driven by which dealers represent them. And so, and who the experts are in the field, right? And so is it, it's just an interesting idea. Like if we're now just putting these out there before tastemakers are, are created, before, you know, best of the best is created, like what does it mean that we're just kind of letting these things like determine their own value? I don't know, thoughts? Uh, is thoughts that for- is that really possible? There are, I mean, it, the, the clubhouse frenzy feeding frenzy on blockchain. I mean, there've instantly emerged tastemakers, hierarchy, you know, and 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 gatekeepers and all of this. It's like sprung up instantly. And the other question, I mean, the other thing, Blake, is, you know, we've learned from uh, Facebook that the, you know, the internet's voting on what's the best brought us uh, Donald Trump, you know? So it, I'm, I'm very suspicious of a certain kind of populism. It's, um, I'm not, in a, I'm, I can't apologize for it, but I don't think we can swap out. There's no easy answer. I think like you were saying, like, is there a solution? I'm not sure. Thank you, Blake. And thank you for those answers. Um, I'd like to turn to Dimitri Chami, if uh, you'd like to ask your question. You should be able to unmute. Hi, um, I didn't know I was going to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you, Anya. Um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for making this wonderful space. I. Um, I, as a digital first artist that's recently discovered NFTs, in spite of what it sounds like in the chat, I've been answering a lot of questions because I've been on Clubhouse for like a month. So take that with a huge grain of salt, um, anything I've written um, in the chat. But I was, someone talked about the, um, it was so far up ahead, but it made me think of, of uh, you know, the aura of the work of art and is the blockchain a new sort of erratic field for for determining a new kind of aura for the works of art, or is it ultimately what Benjamin couldn't foresee, you know, about instead of mechanical reproduction, digital reproduction. So uh, I'm sorry if it's not phrased more articulately. <laughs> I think that's for Steve. Yeah, Steve. Well, I think that uh, again, you know, it's still about art, right? I think there's so much discussion about the blockchain, the technology. I mean, my goal is to promote the artist and help build their careers. And, you know, it's been, it's been a little bit of a struggle, even for someone who's be- dealing with digital for 20 years to grapple with the success. Because in one sense, I'm incredibly ex- excited about, there's a new audience who's appreciating this type of work but what are they actually appreciating? And that's what's um, not quite there for me yet. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a really, um, it's a complex thing right now for the gallery and we're doing a ton of research. Every artist has, we have a strategy for each artist. They each have their own um, kind of direction that they wanna take in this new form. And yeah, it's been, um, it's been, again, a little bit of a struggle to figure out that. I always understood Benjamin a little bit backwards in that um, the, the, the more reproductions there were, the more reverence there was for whatever the reproduced thing was. And so if you scale up reproductions, you increase the erratic potential of the original thing that had been reproduced, which if that's true, then doing something like this online people will hunt for the file. Everybody can see a version of the file. Everybody can see a front facing image of it. People say you can screen grab it and all that sort of stuff. But ultimately there's only one person who can really own it in this blockchain thing. So it might be Benjamin gone wild. Um, 
so I, I think you might be right. That's exactly what's kind of happening. It'll, it'll force us back possibly to finding the original again, if there ever was one. Um, well, what's interesting also is that it, it, the reverse has happened where when typically when I would sell a piece to a collector, they would want to have that um, kind of exclusive experience with the work. Now, the opposite has occurred where the more popular that work is, the more people can experience it, the more valuable it has become. And it's a complete twist of the system in, in my world. Mm. Also, Dimitri, isn't also when you talk about mediation, it's, it's, the, the me it's not the original, it's as it is mediated. It's the media as the authentic, right? Okay, thing. okay. I, I have to just pause here. This is an entire panel of its own <laughs> that deals with like the last 140 years of art. And I totally think that we should have that panel and I hope I see you all on it. Um, but uh, just to pause that whole line of conversation, um, uh, just because I know that we're you know shortly running out of time. Um, before we have one last question that Anya will say, I noticed just now, I'm only now catching up on the chat to be quite honest. There are a lot of questions around the legal uh, issues surrounding blockchain. And there is a lot of information online out there. Um, I would just, if I may, because I'm a book person, I can't help it, I'm that you know old school. Um, I'd like to mention the book called uh, Blockchain and the Law. Um, the Rule of Code. It's by Primavera de Filippi and Aaron Wright. Um, Primavera is an artist. Uh, she's the person who made Plantoid that I mentioned in my intro. So, but she's also an art and law scholar. And the book is uh, came out in 2018. So it doesn't deal with some of the you know sort of newer considerations, particularly around you know some of the. Uh, contract stuff we're getting proof of stake and so forth, but it's a really good overview, A, of blockchain, how it works, if you want the nitty gritty of it, but also what are some of the potential legal ramifications of this new technology being introduced? So for those of you for whom uh, some of the legal considerations are significant, I would highly recommend getting that book. Um, I second that. I was actually going to recommend that book as even great for Blockchain 101. And she's also, leading a team at MIT um, that's working on a governance structure um, for blockchains. And she's a brilliant person to follow. Totally agree. Um, on the last note of recommendations, just because I'm there, I did post in the chat links to some of these those conceptual projects that I'd mentioned in the intro. For those of you, I mean, it's interesting to see when artists are talking specifically about the technology they're using. Um, and those are projects that are specifically doing that. And so when you read the artists talking about it, it can help sort of unpack potentially some of the confusion that um, people new to blockchain experience. But most of the stuff that's out there about blockchain actually isn't about art and blockchain. Um, yeah, there's these articles that have been coming out recently, but so on my last recommendation, and then Anya really will get, take the last question. Um, I wanna recommend a collection. I've destroyed my copy and I apologize. Um, by Ruth Cadlow and Mark Garrett from Furtherfield Gallery in England. Um, it's called Artists Rethinking the Blockchain. Um, again, it came out several years ago, but it does an excellent job of, uh, you know, artists, theorists, critics, um, galleries, uh, speaking to how are we going to deal with this and how do we feel about it and what, are, and what are we addressing around it. So artists rethinking the blockchain, I highly recommend that one as well. And on that note, thank you all. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, I, yeah, I have a final question that's kind of, uh, unfortunately, the people who asked the question um, had to go, um, but I thought it was worth ending on. So the first question is from Matthew Gant, who's saying that Marshall McLuhan says, we conceptualize the new through the metaphors of the old, rather than seeing the new for what it is in its own right. Um, a vital question feels like, how can art use the blockchain as its medium? for egalitarian or conceptually interesting reasons instead of accelerating the flattening of digital art into zombie formalism all over again. Um, and I think also just asking to kind of address like what type of art is occupying the space of blockchain. Um, and another question that I thought goes with that, which was from um, Kenny Kramer, 
who asked about the implications of celebrity sales to the broader NFT ecosystem and if they cheapen the concept by selling their tweets or if it's beneficial um, by bringing the concept to a broader population that otherwise <clears throat> wouldn't be engaged with NFTs. And I think those two kind of go together, thinking about like the flattening of art um, and also the, the popularization of the NFT. I hope those two make sense together. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of what I was talking about a little earlier. Um, obviously, celebrity culture is having a, a drastic impact on um, the valuation of a lot of the um, the successful or the, the, the financially successful drops. Um, I almost envision um, two markets being created. Um, I could see kind of this quick flipping idea of either celebrity type or highly followed artists get doing well. And then what, what I'm more interested in and hopefully will start to happen is a more rigorous uh, curatorial um, look at what's happening. Because right now the, the, there was so much success so quickly with these platforms, they're massive. The average person who goes vis to visit them, it's really challenging unless you're a celebrity type, a dropper, to, to sift through the work, understand what you're seeing, conceptually get it, 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 it's becoming really difficult. So as a gallerist and hopefully other gallerists, I think it's actually the question of if, if the gallery is needed, I think there's a resounding yes at this point because there needs to be um, a more serious look at um, curatorial practice when these things are being presented. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, and I wanted to just share um, related to the egalitarian question, I just wanted to share a project that I think is a beautiful example of the potential um, of blockchain um, to promote artists around the world. Dada.art um, is a drawing platform where artists globally basically draw conversations together and you can buy portions of their conversation um, it's on Ethereum, so with Ether, um, and the the platform attracts artists from all over the world, and literally, like, the they lives have been changed globally by this platform, and so I think that there are these, and then I think of someone, I think of people like, like Kevin Abosh or Claudia, I'm sure you thought about this, like, exploring identity, exploring human moments, um, like, exploring, like, these ethereal concepts, um, I think that there's a lot of potential there, too, so I'll, I'll, yeah. Well, blockchain and the, uh, these questions about authenticity are innately bound to questions of identity. And so and that's another panel, right? There's a few, the last two questions are two panels, then there's this one too, the identity issue and its relation to a construction of identity and culture. Because I think the main thing about blockchain, um, Dimitri, is that um, it's, it's, it's a shift in what is important in our culture now. It's computer culture. It's this acknowledgement that this is this giant force and, and that, that in relation to your question about Walter, right? <laughs> and so if I can, just, but just, you know, just to sort of wrap this up, um, I just wanna say, I think one of the things that I, I, I certainly get a sense of in speaking to you all on that I think I want everyone to think about is that um, com our computer world, our technology culture, isn't just a life in the screen. It is the life we walk around with. These things are not um, completely apart. And so um, we do need to recognize the way in which the technology is influencing us and our practices and our swipe scroll sort of lifestyles, right? And become more aware of that so that we can make more conscious choices. But likewise, we get to now that we're hopefully a little more conscious about the way in which technology has infiltrated our lives to start making choices back in the other direction. Um, and I think that if there's a takeaway that I can ask everyone um, to consider in the weeks and months and years to come is, we are participants in the culture that's being produced and we need to recognize that and become active voices in it. 
So with that, I think it's a perfect moment to ask um, a far more eloquent voice than I, uh, Sam Riviere, perhaps to read some of his poetry um, and help us uh, remember that other side. Hi, oh, thank you. Um, thank you for an amazing discussion. I've been riveted by it. Um, I think just from a, hearing this from a sort of literary or um, poetry standpoint is particularly, been particularly thought provoking because I suppose poetry has been dematerialized, if you like, since it's existed. Like the problem, the original is a question in poetry. There isn't really one. You can memorize it. It's easy to copy it out. And I found myself imagining a world where a poem would have its exclusivity or scarcity kind of confected in the, in the way that you've been discussing with these digital artworks, right? And I have to say it was a, a bleak vision. <laughs> um, uh, and that like a poem owned by one person really would be valueless because the value of a poem is based on the discourse around it to a large extent, I think. Anyway, but thank you to everyone on the panel. It was really interesting. Um, so I'm just gonna read like a, a, a couple of short poems that um, to try and speak to the theme a little bit were um, uh, written or uh, composed using um, a neural network, GPT-2. So these are AI poems. I wonder if they're simulations of poems. Um, after mode. I've always been impressed by people who manage to maintain relationships beyond the normal bounds of traditional marriage. There seems to be something in us capable of building deep attachments that cannot possibly be sustained, even on a permanent physical level. Many years ago, someone on Reddit wrote something that made me wonder if perhaps the nature of the relationship was actually very complex, because there has always been another side to a person I knew, one that might not be fully revealed. My friend had one more layer of intimacy, but it was invisible to him, and that made it that much more painful for us. My question here, if human sexuality cannot be entirely understood because it involves more fictional realities than conventional reality, why shouldn't our real world partners be more mysterious, perhaps like some alien kind of beings that can touch and communicate via telepathy? Uh, this poem's called Darkened Dogs. In our post-millennial context, the past seems to come alive through its ability to give instant gratification on a cultural scale, which has only recently become a fact of everyday life. When that fleeting feeling for something as abstract as the 80s is coupled with an ever-present desire to connect with an ideal version of ourselves, which has all the markings and nuances of our previous incarnations, we might easily mistake those moments as our only opportunity for authentic experience. My personal favorite example, in the 80s, I remember my parents driving me to our school in the autumn, which is conveniently the season my first memories of any sort began. I was eight or nine then. We pulled up outside a brick building. It had a roof covered in a thick canopy of leaves from which sunlight filtered down towards a giant sign on the gate. The windows opened on a warm October day, and there on the road below glinted the first spark of the new century. My mind could instantly process that image, and with the memory being so vivid, it took no more than a few seconds to see how beautiful those words above had been. And I'll just read uh, two more very short poems. Dead PDF. No more to my name than a small poem written on the margins of a newspaper. There should be nothing for them to believe except in dreams. For now, these strange notes are only known to my sister. I'll try to recall the story of the cat who got inside the cellar one summer. A woman was having trouble sleeping in a neighboring house and tried to sneak down to see what the noise was. She entered through one of the windows and had an encounter with a strange being. He called to her with those eyes of his, as strange as any that she had ever seen. She saw him looking with fear into a cellar window above her head, and she heard him ask her something. In the afternoon, his body seemed to disappear into the house, as if one hand were pulling at him while another was lifting his chin. The cellar door had been closed tightly. The night had been warm and silent and dark. 
In the cellar windows, light had not flashed. It would soon take him too. The next morning, the body vanished and no trace of any human voice was found. Uh, and finally, safe poem. It would not have mattered if his parents could have seen the face he lived with every morning, how it was shaped and stretched like an ode to the future. He still would have smiled through it like in the picture. All was clear. The image hung there as long as he breathed on it. For years now it had bloomed, becoming less static, more intricate with age, growing wider and fainter, changing to a colorless translucent shade that only made him smile more slowly, more lovingly, as if in pain from it. Thanks for listening. Though. Thank you so much, Sam. That was a perfect way to, to close out this event. And a thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Rai. Thank you, Charlotte, Anne, and Stephen. And thank you all for your questions and for this an incredible chat full of information and ponderings and uh, comments. And this has been a really, really wonderful event. Um, so thank you all. Um, and we are celebrating the RAIL's 20th anniversary through this year. The RAIL is a, 20, uh, is a nonprofit organization. So if you enjoyed this event, please consider making a donation to keeping the RAIL and our special projects like the NSE free, relevant, and independent. And you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for one year together apart, a new social environment celebration. We're marking our one year anniversary of daily conversations uh, of our NSE series. And that'll feature performances, readings, and more from section editors and contributors of the rail. So that'll be very exciting. Um, and now you should be able to turn on your microphones to say goodbye and thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Upload it onto our event. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Sean. Thank you, Charlotte. That was amazing. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> um, everyone, have a, a wonderful afternoon and uh, and see you soon. Bye. Bye. bye.